We are talking all about regenerative medicine today on the show. My guest is Dr. Koshal Latifzai. He's the co-founder of Rocky Mountain Regenerative Medicine. It's a medical clinic in Boulder, Colorado that specializes in regenerative medicine. They have a lot of offerings. It's a really cool place. I'll link up their website. You can check it out. Um, we're going to get into some of it today. Um, to give you a little background on Dr. Latifzai, he's a graduate of Dartmouth Medical School and Yale University Emergency Medicine Residency Program, um, has been in practice for over 15 years and made the shift about seven years ago, um, coming into the regenerative side of medicine. And so we're getting really pretty deep into peptides today and also... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because if you're watching on video, it is so windy out here in Hawaii. My hair is going crazy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Had to laugh. Excuse me. Um, yeah, we're talking about uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, and stem cells. He's talking about why he doesn't um, use like outside sources of stem cells, why he harvests them from someone directly, which obviously you got to be able to be kind of skilled to do that. Um, <laughs> so it's really cool that they offer that. Um, we're getting into a little bit at the end about um, psychedelics and um, their th therapeutic applications. He's also... Um, an advocate of that. So yeah, we'll go ahead and get into it. We're going to learn a lot about how you can regenerate your own body um, and be more proactive about your healing and your longevity. So let's go ahead and dive in. Here is Dr. Koshal Latif Sai. All right. So Dr. K, I was telling you before we got started here that I find often when people ask me about like injuries and what should I do about these things, you know, I've got something, I feel like I've got some tendonitis or maybe I might possibly be partially tearing something and I'll say, have you heard of, have you tried PRP or regenerative medicine? And they just look at me like a deer in headlights. And that is like almost every single time. So I'm like, wow, a lot of people don't even know that regenerative medicine exists. They just go straight to Western medicine and they're essentially given corticosteroids and told that they need surgery eventually, or maybe physical therapy. Like that feels like the, the route that almost everyone I talk to, um, knows of, right? And so I'm really yeah. excited to have you here because you started in Western medicine. Like, quite, can you tell a little bit of your story and how you got into regenerative medicine? And then we'll get into like what it entails. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, when I started in, in conventional medicine, um, and I still practice conventional medicine, uh -huh. you know, I hadn't heard of the utility of peptides and stem cell therapy as was the type of therapy that I associated with may maybe cancer therapy. Um, it wasn't really something that I knew a whole lot about. And you're right. I reach for what everybody else is accustomed to drugs, medications, surgery. Um, so it wasn't a, something that I, that I was keen to in med school. Um, and it's something that I sort of fell into and have actually gone pretty far in at this point. Um, and, uh, and I think the journey is sort of worthwhile discussing. So I started out, my undergrad training was in biology. Uh, I was an undergrad at the university of Missouri. And then, um, I sort of migrated to the East coast for med school. I went to Dartmouth med school, and then I went to Yale university for training in emergency medicine. And, um, once I graduated, I moved to Colorado. I practiced in emergency medicine at level one trauma centers at small community hospitals. And it really gave me a unique perspective into how medicine in general is practiced. Um, and from that experience, and I was doing that for about 10 years or so, um, you know, I, I understood from the inside how over reliant, how dependent we are on some of the things that you mentioned, which is medications, which is surgery. And it really highlighted for me this reactionary, this reactive approach to our health, to our wellness that we take. In other words, we wait for something to break down mm -hmm. and then we are prompted to take action more out of necessity than anything else and sort of stepping back a little bit you know i realized that that's just a consequence of the way that our medical system is structured it has some strengths and it has significant weaknesses the strengths are if you actually have a broken bone if you actually have some sort of an accident and it's something that requires surgery like an appendectomy mm -hmm. this is a great country to be in <laughs> but right. when you're focused on optimizing 
your mind, your body. Um, this type of health system really doesn't serve us very well because, mm -hmm. again, the, the, the way that the system is structured, uh, the primary pair are the insurance companies. And if they're the primary pair, then the, the, the patient is really taken out of that equation. The, the patient really comes in secondary. So it's no wonder that when people are asking for optimization, the system really can't cater to them. And right. so that was the realization that I came to. That was about seven years ago. And it prompted me to, uh, to explore options outside of quote unquote hospital medicine or conventional medicine. And so do I still prescribe medications? Sure, I do from time to time, mm -hmm. uh, antibiotics, et cetera. Uh, but it's pretty sparingly. I really mm -hmm. want to emphasize empowering the person's own biology to heal itself. And there are certainly uh, options available in terms of nutrition, exercise, that that accomplishes that but there are also these regenerative options that also augment our health in in slightly different ways and so i'm happy to discuss those further but that's how i came to stem cell therapy peptides hormones um so there's a plethora of stuff that you do but that's probably the crux of of a lot of the stuff that we do here at this clinic and i i started this clinic about seven years ago um here in in boulder um, with another physician, Dr. Voss, Voss Iliopoulos, and he's got a very similar background to me. And then we started recruiting a lot of the staff that were like-minded, um, including my wife, who's a nurse practitioner. She used to be an nice. ER nurse, but almost everybody at our clinic are now, uh, they, they've been formally trained in, uh, in some aspect of medicine. So. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that story and many kudos because it's very appreciated. You know, like sometimes I wonder, I, I, I'm trying to be sensitive to what I say. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I wonder what it's like when you have that awareness in commitment. And I, I totally agree with everything you said. Like there's yeah. definitely a time and a place like antibiotics can save your life. You know, obviously they're not, it's not ideal when it's like over prescribed or whatever, but they can also save someone's life, you know? So, and surgery, right. Right. if I get a car accident, like I definitely appreciate someone being able to like put me back together. But I often wonder what it's like, like when you do have that awareness as a medical doctor in that system, you know, it's like, it's kind of like you have a, a choice, you have a, this moment of choice of like what you're going to do with that awareness. And it takes a lot of work to do what you did and your wife and your partner and all of that. So I, it's really appreciated. And, and I appreciate you coming on the show too, because I want to get into a little bit of um, like options for people who have like maybe injuries, because yeah. this is the thing that I see. I think people are starting to learn about, you know, obviously hormones and that's kind of popular and, and even peptides is getting more popular. But I find that this little thing of like, oh, something's going on with like my shoulder or I've got like high hamstring tendonitis. They don't even know about regenerative medicine. So can right. you talk about if somebody's got sure. some injuries coming on, what options are available to them? Yeah, let's start with peptides first. Um, okay. Peptides are, if you've never heard that term, um, you know, they're, they're, they're smaller versions of proteins. So proteins are made up of something called amino acids. Um, and, um, and, and some of these proteins are, are rather large. So they contain hundreds and hundreds of, of amino acids sort of put together. But it turns out in order to carry out certain functions in our body, um, you don't need the entire protein to get that job done. It, you need a small, that, that really the business part of that protein, which happens to be much smaller. Uh, in a lot of instances, it's smaller than 50 amino acids, and we refer to those as peptides. So a common example that you are probably familiar with is insulin. Insulin was the first peptide that was discovered and it, again, it turns out that you don't need this huge protein to get sugar from the bloodstream into cells. You need just that small part that interacts with the receptor on the cell surface to bring about certain intracellular actions. And um, somebody was bright enough to be able to isolate that small portion, develop it in a lab. And these days, the insulin that diabetics have to take out of necessity, they're much smaller than, than the proteins that exist in non-diabetic individuals, um, even though we refer to both of them as insulin. And by that same token, um, since the inception of this field of, of medicine, 
um, people have discovered that there's a lot of other peptides that carry um, that carry out other functions other than just getting sugar into into cells. And a few that have been in the news recently, um, they go by names like Wagovi or Azempic or semaglutide. There's other peptides that are also um, sort of serve the same function. The reason they're so popular, the reason I say they're in the news these days, is um, is there these peptides? Some of them were devised again for diabetics. I know we just got done talking about that, but one of the side effects of semaglutide or terzipatide, which is a different peptide in the same class, is significant weight loss. And so it sort of caught the the attention of the media because some of these individuals can, in some of the studies, have lost upward of twenty to twenty five percent of their body weight, and obesity being as big of a problem as it is in the US and in particular in the Western world in general, that those two peptides are, are now in the news. But there's other peptides that we've been using for far longer uh, that really pertain to our patients. And some of them are directed um, for uh, boosting one's immune system, especially when it comes to autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or chagrins. There's a whole plethora of those types of diseases. But there's other peptides out there that really augment one's athletic ability. Mm -hmm. And um, along those terms, um, there's some that that will increase bone density or muscle mass. It'll allow an athlete to respond better to their workouts. Um, there's other peptides that will augment one's ability to uh, recover from injuries. And essentially, really aggressive exercise is a form of injury. So the faster one can recover from those, the more workouts that they can squeeze into, into a day. And so some of these peptides have gotten a little bit of a bad rap because they are considered performance enhancing, which in my opinion speaks to their efficacy. It speaks to their effectiveness. Uh, but yeah, they certainly are on the list of banned substances, according to some of these regulatory agencies like USADA or WADA. But for everyday individuals, um, they they can have access to those peptides uh, as long as you're not a professional athlete um, and you're sort of a weekend warrior, you're a semi-professional athlete. Um, as long as you know those those limitations that, yeah, some of these agencies do kind of frown on their use because they they augment a, an athlete's ability. As long as you understand that for most people, they can they can use those peptides um, without issue. So that's peptide. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah. On that vein, um, which of those are you favoring these days the most? Because yeah. I've seen them kind of change and, you know, yeah. um, no, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of these peptides are isolated from, uh, we know about them because of human biology. So we already make some these peptides on some level. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind uh, was isolated from the stomach. Uh, and it's referred to as BPC-157. Um, and that particular peptide is really important for regenerating tissue. And some of that research came out of Croatia. Um, that that showed, and this was like in the 1970s. So this peptide has been around for a while. Um, but what it showed was that it helps tissue regenerate muscle, tendons, bones that are injured. It really, it's also sometimes referred to as the Wolverine peptide, um, mm -hmm. referring to the superhero who, who regenerates um, tissue rather quickly. Um, so I like the use of BPC-157. BPC there's a couple of other peptides. Um, one of them uh, is, is a combination of two different peptides. It's referred to as CJC ipamorolin, uh, mm -hmm. two different peptides in one. Um, and then there's a different one called tessamorolin. Um, and those mm -hmm. two augment one's ability to produce growth hormone. Um, mm -hmm. Similar to some of the other hormones like testosterone, for instance, its level, its production in our bodies declines with age. And so in uh, that in growth hormone is no exception there. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the what you want to be careful about, because the obvious question is, why not just take growth hormone then? Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that growth hormone is secreted in a cyclical way in our bodies. And if you eliminate that by introducing growth hormone, um, it establishes it, it gets rid of that cyclical um, frequency. And so it becomes this elevated plateau. And that could cause other issues, other problems, other side effects. But if you maintain that frequency, which is what these peptides do, they maintain that, that cyclic nature, 
um, of, of secretion, of growth hormone secretion, um, then you can get the benefits of growth hormone without necessarily risking some of the drawbacks. So, mm. uh, so are you saying that you could take like, let's say CJC, if a Moreland combo, like you could just keep taking that like forever without coming off of it and it wouldn't yeah, affect your own growth hormone. That's a really good question. Um, so anytime this is true, not just for peptides, but especially for hormones, this is true for other medications. If you're taking a medication, um, then it's probably replacing some function that will have occurred naturally in your body. Mm -hmm. And as biological beings, as dynamic beings, um, our, our, whenever that happens, our, our body's ability to, to, to do that something atrophies to an extent. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you take a medication that takes over and augments your, your own ability to, to do something, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you atrophy, your body sort of forgets, quote unquote, right. uh, how to do that something. And so, um, it, 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 and you build tolerance, you need a higher dose of that something to, to, to again, hit mm -hmm. the mark. And mm -hmm. so, um, so that's a concept that's not foreign to peptides either, just like it's not foreign to any mm -hmm. of the other medications. So if somebody, I, I never prescribe these peptides lifelong. Um, <laughs> yeah. What I tend to do is cycle from one peptide to the next. And mm -hmm. if you, if you do that, or if there's interruption uh, in you dosing yourself, um, it helps preserve your own ability to produce those peptides. Mm. And that's really important. I think it, it, on a sort of grander scale, what it highlights is, um, you know, there are, there are pharmacies out there that have become online dispensaries for some mm. of these peptides. Mm -hmm. And they certainly, from a marketing standpoint, I think they're doing a great job of telling people about these peptides. But then mm -hmm. they leave it up to the individual themselves to, to order the peptides. And um, the drawback, I see several drawbacks because I've had patients who will come to me. Um, on the one hand, the patients will say, hey, the cost, it turns out, is a little bit less if I order this uh, from, uh, from an online pharmacy as opposed to a compounding pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And um, there used to be an element of truth to that. But when you really look at how much of a peptide is contained in a bottle and do an apples to apples comparison mm -hmm. to the peptides that we would order for you from a re reputable um, compounder, it turns out there's not much of a difference. And a lot of times it's about mm -hmm. the same. It, it's it's mm -hmm. the exact same amount of milligrams. Mm -hmm. um, but even, even if there are some cost savings, if you really read the fine print on those online ph pharmacies, They'll say this is not for human consumption, that mm -hmm. this is for research purposes only. Mm -hmm. It's only used in vitro, meaning in a test tube. So it's not it's not for you. And if you call them to ask about dosing, they, they won't give you any guidance at all. Yep. <laughs> you're going to be mean? really confused, too, because you're going to have no <laughs> idea how to mix like it. You can make up some ground by going to these online forums, but ultimately... Mm -hmm. Um, like the, the bottom line is you want to, they do have side effects. All these peptides mm -hmm. have certain side effects. You certainly don't want to be taking it for years and years. You want to, you want to kind of rotate. Um, you want to have a few good peptides that serve your specific biology, your specific needs and objectives. And you want to sort of rotate them and not stay mm -hmm. on one for years and years. So thank you for sharing all that. I tried, um, to, they don't do Ipamorlin by itself anymore, right? You can't get that by itself you, you can usually can. it's mixed together okay. because most okay. people will order it together yeah okay I, a few years ago um someone was going to come on the podcast and so they gave me you know a, a clinic like yours yeah. and they gave me three months and i tried if in preparation for that and then they ended up closing that clinic and he shifted so i still haven't had him on i <laughs> didn't on but yeah. i tried it for three months for that reason and I mean, I'm already pretty lean and strong. I sleep really well. I feel like I recover really well. So it wasn't like I felt like I like needed it per se, but yeah. I will say based off my experience, I was like, I felt like I was sleeping. I, I'm a deep sleeper already, but I felt like I was sleeping so well that I was like ecstatically happy, like not ecstatically, but like very happy when I woke yeah. up, like yeah. super optimistic outlook on life, like tons of energy. I did feel like I was recovering a little better from my workouts. I felt it, you know, a teeny bit more, like it was a little easier to be lean, a little easier to gain muscle. And so yeah. 
I I would say my my overall experience with it was extremely positive. Like I was like, okay, that could be a nice boost for the right person, you know, get the ball rolling. But I mean, if you look at the health benefits, like I didn't say on it just because of what we just talked about. I thought, I don't know yeah, yeah. I really want to be on this, like, you know, ongoing or something. But when you look at the health benefits, I'm like, it is kind of like pretty amazing little biohack, so to say, you know, like it's yeah. a lot of positives. So thanks for sharing about that. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I yeah, second. No doubt that it, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, there's no doubt that these peptides work used in the right dose, used in the right way. Yeah, It's really important to get to know the patient and get to know their goals because we've all taken stuff that our friend takes or family member takes <laughs> right. and it certainly works but they may not serve you in the same way because your needs are different or your objectives are different. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, there's, you know, you mentioned sleep. There's a peptide called DSIP, deep sleep inducing Mm. peptide or a Delta Mm. wave um, uh, inducing peptide, um, Mm. Delta sleep inducing peptide. And and that's really good for augmenting certain aspects of your sleep. But Mm. like, look, if you don't have any sleep issues, then right. there's there's no <laughs> reason to take that particular medication right. uh, because it turns out that even though deep sleep is good, even though delta wave sleep is is really beneficial, uh, sort of sleep in general is really beneficial, and you need that that you know sleep in its entirety as opposed to augmenting certain aspects of it. So if somebody has dedicated insomnia that they've been diagnosed with it, it might help them out, but it may not help you out. Right, And so it's really important to to understand that these options are available, but what are your goals is is probably the next important question. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just want to really second your encouragement to go through a, some place like yours to get your stuff. Cause I'll have friends message me and they're like, I got some peptides online. Like how much of this bacteriostatic water do I need to mix? I'm like, I don't know, dude. I, I, don't, I know. don't know, man. Good look, there are, there are a lot of bro science websites that are, think are pretty <laughs> good. Um, and, uh, and I should clarify, we don't make these peptides. There's a few compounding pharmacies around the country that we work with mm-hmm. um, that we we know are doing things the right way. There's a lot of variability when it comes to compounding pharmacies. And mm-hmm. uh, frankly, I don't have much experience with some of these online pharmacies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't ordered from them, but what gives me a little bit of pause is what I told you, which is um, one, like if you really do the math on how much you're getting per bottle, you're not saving a whole lot and chances are you're probably paying the same amount. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, um, they're clearly saying it's not for human consumption and maybe they're doing right. that to get around some regulatory hurdles, but ultimately if they're not going to give you guidance on dosing, if it, you know, and they can't vouch for the, the purity, um, right. and, and, uh, absence of contamination, then why take the risk? Totally. Um, so anyway. Yeah. You're like literally injecting it in your body. It's like a little, <laughs> little, yeah. um, disconcerting. Okay. Um, thank you for all that. Can we talk about, uh, PRP and stem cells? Cause I'm really curious yeah. to just pick your brain, like in your practice, like, um, do you guys do a lot of PRP and what would be the applications for PRP that you've done? I mean, I know there's even like aesthetic, but I'm talking more like maybe like injuries. Yeah, um, yeah. and how have you seen that work maybe in comparison to stem cell treatments? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. So PRP stands for platelet rich plasma, uh, and platelets are, they're not quite cells, but let's just call them cells. Uh, they're, they, they lack a, a, a specific aspect of a cell, which is the nucleus. And so they don't quite fit that definition. Uh, but again, let's just call them cells. They're produced in the liver and their primary function in the body is to form clots. Um, so if one were to cut their skin or break a bone, that would be certainly an instance where you need um, that function of your body to be operating at its, at, at its maximum. Um, And it turns out that these platelets are full of granules that contain messengers um, that call on other cell types to arrive on scene. So imagine cutting yourself and these platelets are one of the first entities to arrive. They start, they stop the bleeding. They start laying down the groundwork for the healing process, which is going to then take weeks and weeks and sort of to kick up, to kick off that process they release their contents, their granules. Um, They undergo a process called degranulation. And those messengers are then picked up by the bloodstream and it calls on other cell types to 
to to follow that that scent, if you will, through a mm-hmm. process nice. called chemotaxis. And once it arrives on scene, they exit the blood the blood vessels. They arrive on scene and they start directing traffic to try to heal. And the notable cells there are your stem cells. We have stem cells in our fat. We have stem cells in our bone marrow, areas that are really rich in in stem cells. And then we have areas where we're sort of poor in stem Mm -hmm. cells. And a good example there is our nervous system, especially the central nervous system, where there's there's a paucity of 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 these these healing entities, the stem cells, which are the primary cellular repairman um, in in our bodies. And so, um, anywhere where we lack stem cells, we're going to be slow to heal, and that includes joints. As we're getting older, the number of stem cells <clears throat> that migrate from inside the bone marrow into a joint, into a disc in the lumbar spine. It, it, it declines with mm-hmm. aging. That's just a consequence of aging. Earlier, I said your testosterone level, your hormones decline, your peptides decline. And here it is something else that's going down, which are your stem cells. And usually that process sort of picks up steam or, or crosses over a critical threshold around age 40 or so. And so you might notice that injuries are starting to linger. Maybe you're doing the same types of exercise, but before Um, you were able to bounce back from certain injuries and now they're lasting longer and longer and longer. And a lot of those injuries happen to be taking place at a place where you don't have very many stem cells to begin with, which is your joints, your lumbar spine. And so the concept behind stem cell therapy is to take them from an area where your stem cell rich and then introduce them, sort of bypass the traffic problem, bypass the blood vessels, and introduce them directly into an area where you don't have very many of these cells um, to bring about repair and regeneration. And so, um, so that's what we do is, is stem cell therapy. We're able to take stem cells from bone marrow. We're able to take stem cells from fat and there's pros and cons to mm-hmm. each one of those methodologies. And mm-hmm. overall, for a number of reasons that I'm happy to go into, it's, it's more convenient to access those cells from fat and then reintroduce those cells into an area where you don't have very many of them. And, um, and it really would behoove that, that the, the patient um, to not wait too long to a point where their disease process, the thing that's causing them pain is really advanced. Because if you do that, um, then, then whatever therapy you institute, even if it's medication, if it's surgery, they have less likelihood of reversing that disease process and, mm-hmm. and working. And that's kind of a hard concept to explain to an athlete, right? Because athletes are used to the grind, they're used to the pain, it's worn as a badge of honor to get mm-hmm. injured and push through it. And it turns out like the longer you wait, um, then you're doing more harm than good. Because like most other therapies, stem cells, their effectiveness sort of declines the longer you wait and the more advanced the disease process becomes. So that's mm-hmm. what sort of stem cell therapy is. Mm-hmm. Platelet-rich plasma, which is where this, this question began, it's, it's a methodology for taking uh, platelets in, in a, a volume of blood and isolating those and isolating the, the platelets, the proteins that are in the blood, uh, in reintroducing those in a similar fashion into a joint or, or what have you, wherever the person is injured. And so um, the way we do it, there's different methodologies for this. The way we do it is, is probably take uh, about 250 milliliters of, of blood, um, which is more than what most people are accustomed to if, if you're going in to do blood work at your doctor. Uh, but it's not a foreign concept if you've ever donated blood, like a unit of mm-hmm. blood is, is larger in volume than what I just described. Um, and so we, we take about 250 mLs and we spin that down a few times. And when you do that, you're separating out um, something that's a little bit more dense, which is the red blood cells and trying to get rid of those. And you're really trying to isolate these specific healers in the body, the, the platelets, along with other proteins that also exist in our plasma that are also important for healing and regeneration. And once you get those, there's different applications, orthopedic being the primary one that we've used it for, but we've also used it for, um, for aesthetic reasons, um, for wrinkles or for regeneration of hair. And it's worked pretty well for those mm-hmm. patients as well. 
cycle. So, so that in a, in a, in a big nutshell is, is PRP therapy and stem cell therapy. Thank you for that. And I'm curious, like, I mean, <laughs> cause like, I don't know, I've kind of been floating around in this world for a minute. So like, sometimes I'll hear people tell me their story with stem cells and how it like literally saved their lives. And they were like, couldn't walk for like a year and then they got stem cells, and now they're like riding horses and stuff. Like I have like those people. And then I have people, I'm just being real who like, are like, Oh, I got stem cells in my knee and it didn't really, I don't think it really did that much. Right. Or, and then I have people who I got PRP from some hamstring tendonitis I had from my marathon running days. And it was like miraculous for me. And mm. I just don't really know that many other people who have done PRP to yeah. get, you know, anecdotal just you know experience i'm just curious like have you found prp to be very effective for certain applications you know like wow this yeah. it does really well for this and you know what i mean no it's a, it's a great it's a great question um prp stem cell therapy it doesn't work for for everybody mm -hmm. um that, that's for sure so there's one aspect of you got to do your homework and pick the right type of patient and to that end um, you know, what we do is sort of quote unquote, vet the patient. How do we do that? Well, a lot of times we'll do a really extensive panel of labs. So it's really rare for somebody to just seek us out and only want to do stem cell therapy or only want to do PRP therapy. And the reason is it matters the the biology of the individual matters. What mm -hmm. kind of biological milieu you're introducing these cells into Makes sense. has a huge impact. And right. so there's been plenty of instances where somebody sought us out for stem cell therapy. And then we have a discussion about their metabolic health, their cardiovascular right. health. Right. And, you know, a year later, it turns out we sort of totally got sidetracked for good reason, because mm. it was a bunch of other things that we right. needed to address first. We don't just jump into stem Makes cell sense. therapy. And I should have I should have mentioned, you know, the way we operate at our clinic is on a membership level for the most part. Uh huh. Cool. And so a lot of these patients who came in for stem cell therapy, um, you know, it, it, it became a second priority once it's pointed out to them, like, look, you're, uh, for lack of a better term, you're really unhealthy, and we need <laughs> to get you to a point where you're yeah. much healthier, where you can get more out of life than right. than just this, this PRP therapy or this stem cell therapy. So that's one thing is, is you got to mm -hmm. fix the biology of the, of the individual before any of these other therapies have a good mm. shot at working. And I can't tell you how many people have come to us just wanting peptide therapy because their friends doing it or their family right. members. And it's like, well, you, you, like, let's talk about your health and, and how to get you to a much better spot first. And so right. once we check that box, um, even then, like you're right, stem cell therapy and PRP therapy doesn't work for everybody, but for the vast majority of people, it has, the, they, they exhibit, um, significant improvement. And so there's still, um, a little bit of, of, um, selecting the right therapy for the right patient. Sometimes people will come in requesting PRP therapy, and it turns out that stem cell therapy is probably a better option, uh, a, a better option for them. And then there's a lot of variability as far as these procedures are concerned. So the reason I highlighted how much blood we require for our PRP therapy, it, turn, it, 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 it turns out it matters how much blood mm. you use, because mm. um, there's certainly places that'll take like three or four of those little test tubes um, that see. you provide to your doctor and isolating uh, platelets from that is going to be really, really limited. You can't squeeze mm. water out of, out of a rock. You can't squeeze more platelets out of a small volume of blood because even mm. if your process is super efficient, um, you're not going to be successful in doing that. And what we've done at our clinic, the way we came up with the volume of blood that we have is because we've, we've, we actually track this stuff, just like we track all the biomarkers for all of our patients to see how we're doing We've mm -hmm. done platelet counts on different methodologies, nice. different kits, and sort of have perfected like what is the optimal level nice. of platelets that'll nice. that'll bring about good. And so uh, it's not a, it, this is our methodology that we've devised <laughs> that we've developed. We're not relying on somebody else's mm -hmm. methods. Mm -hmm. um, nice. And then when when it comes to to stem cell therapy, that's something else where there's a lot of heterogeneity. So when you said, "Hey, my friend." Um, you know, for, for some people it works, for some people it doesn't, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's two broad categories of stem cell therapy. One is allergenic where you 
um, what, what's deployed are, are donated cells, right. cells that are totally foreign to, to the person themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's risky for a number of reasons, but I'll get into that. That's one category. The other one is autologous, where we use your own cells. And I discussed that earlier when I alluded to bone marrow. Yeah, I wanted to hit on this. Uh -huh. or, or fat harvesting. Because if you use allergenic uh, therapy, you're really uh, at the mercy of whoever is producing or manufacturing those, those stem cells. And in mm -hmm. fact, when, um, when they've done studies and have taken aliquots of those allogenic stem cells and tried to grow out stem cells, it turns out none grow out. <laughs> and wow. I, I frequently uh, hear patients coming in specifically requesting something called Wharton's jelly. Um, and when they've tried to grow cells from Wharton's jelly, which is from umbilical cord, uh, okay. presumably cells from um, umbilical cord, it turns out there it's acellular. There's no cells in that concoction that they've, wow. you know, that, that that they've collected. And and then the other piece is even if there are cells there, these are proteins that don't belong to you. These are proteins that right. are foreign to you. And the reason that's important is your immune system is not going to be able to differentiate if these cells are there to do you harm or if they're right. there to do you good. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, you know, nothing bad happens, despite what I just what, what I just told you. But every once in a while, those those immune cells, um, in the process of making antibodies against that protein, that foreign protein, it it makes antibodies against tissue that are native that's native to you, and mm -hmm. it can lead to again this class of diseases referred to as autoimmune diseases. Oh, so geez. now the cells are gone. It's years and years <laughs> later. And now these cells, your own immune system is targeting your own tissue and it's oh, causing, wow. causing problems. Wow. And so it's a, it's a risk in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, to do allogenic stem cell therapy. Mm -hmm. And then even when it comes to autologous stem cell therapy, which is what I prefer, um, you, you sort of sidestep this potential for autoimmune disease, uh, development, um, there's, there's a lot of heterogeneity as far as what kind of a process is, is used to harvest those cells. And that matters in how effective the, the therapy will be. So even though we use the term really frequently of stem cell therapy or PRP, um, the bottom line is I think the important takeaway here is that there's a lot of variability between how these, um, these processes, these procedures are performed. It wasn't that long ago when you know we have several large orthopedic groups here near where where I live, and I think that's the same as a lot of other major cities out there. They used to really scoff at um, at PRP and stem cell therapy, and now every major orthopedic group around here um, they have someone on staff who specializes mm -hmm. in either stem cell therapy or PRP or mm -hmm. both. So on the one hand, it's nice to get acknowledgement that they're finally catching on. On the other hand. Um, you know, you question, um, you question how invested they are in that form of therapy because their mm -hmm. bread and butter remains joint replacement, their mm -hmm. bread and butter remains surgery. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but you know, for your audience, it really matters researching the individuals, reading online reviews, going in and not planning on doing anything, just meet the doctor, meet the staff and sort of come away with an impression that's honest um, about, about your feeling for, for that clinic. And if, and if it sounds like maybe they don't know the science as much as they, they, you expect them to, then that's probably, um, that's probably a hard pass that, that, you should, that you should take. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And like my many, many, many experience that kind of backs up what you just said with uh, stem cells <laughs> was just, I have a friend, I had a friend who uh, owned a med spa, right? So I was going into her place and I was like, okay, I'll try this girly stuff. I'll try like a micro needling, right? And so I did micro needling with PRP, okay, for my face. And yeah. they told me about the PRP. I was like, oh, you guys put PRP on people's faces? I didn't know that. That's cool. It's kind of like biohacking health optimization. I was yeah. like, that's really cool. Let me try it tried it. I was like, wow, this was super effective. Like I was like, I really noticed some yeah. benefits from this. And then I went in another time and the gal talked me into, she's like, oh, well, if you liked that, you should try stem cells this time. It's just a little bit more money. And it's like so awesome. And I'm like, yeah. let's go for it. Nothing. 
no. it like made no difference yeah. hardly at all yeah. on my yeah. skin. And it kind of just, I'm sharing that with everybody because it kind of opened me up to like, wait a minute, maybe having my own body's <laughs> stuff Hundred, is yeah. a little more effective, you know? So that's my like really yeah. weak example that I experienced myself that kind of got yeah. me in the way of thinking you're describing here. <laughs> yeah. And I think the allergenic products are basically off the shelf, right? Like the, the donated mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it's really the, the learning curve, the barrier to entry is really low. So, you know, I, I live here in Colorado and, and sure enough, kind of like wherever you had that experience, we have uh, estheticians at these at these places, at salons, um, doing PRP, doing doing stem mm -hmm. cell therapy, but mm -hmm. using this allogenic product because mm -hmm. you don't have to learn um, a whole new t surgical technique. There's no there's mm -hmm. no you know unless you're you're being really um, mm -hmm. negligent. There's no uh, impetus to 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 be mindful of sterile technique when it comes to allergenic product. Uh, but the, the barrier to entry is a lot higher uh, if you're doing bone marrow harvesting or right. if you're doing a liposuction. <laughs> a uh, liposuction yeah. machine, you're not going to be able to do that. And <laughs> right. so, um, and so it, you know, like trust your gut, go in and just like, you know, interviewing several plumbers and, and yeah. picking the best one. Nice. This is your body. You should probably do the right. same thing with a doctor. So, yeah, nice. Thank you. Okay. I have to keep you just a second longer because when I find a health professional and doctor who is uh, talking about the legal legalization of psychedelics. I have to bring it up because yeah. um, I'm I'm a yeah. it's been life changing for me. And I, I know you have ketamine treatments already, and that's legally where we're at. But I was wondering if you could share your viewpoints on the legalization of psychedelics for healing. Yeah, uh, in Colorado, I don't. You're probably aware already if yeah. you're uh, if you're close to this topic um, that psychedelics, specifically psilocybin. Mm -hmm. uh, has been legalized for mm -hmm. personal use, meaning you can grow mushrooms and, and take it for yourself. Uh, but look, we we have patients from all walks of life, and I'm always envious of of our patients. They've got really interesting lives, um, mm -hmm. and they're they're really attuned to this stuff. And some of yeah. them are jumping in with both feet and establishing companies that serves nice. different functions. Um, you know, given this new legislation, um, but the science is certainly there. Where, mm -hmm. you know, for years and years, we've pushed uh, medications that everybody's heard of, antidepressants, anti-anxiety mm -hmm. medications, um, um, other psychotropic medications. And it turns out, you know, it, it doesn't work as well as we thought. Mm -hmm. It can lead to other side effects, some of which are pretty serious and debilitating. And here we've got something in, 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 um, in psychedelic medicine that has a profoundly better track record, whether it's ketamine, psilocybin, or what have you. And so um, what we do at our clinic is, um, is, is ketamine. That's what mm -hmm. we're legally allowed to do, which mm -hmm. is a medication that was developed in the 60s and 70s. It was used in the Vietnam War primarily as an anesthetic. And in most hospitals these days, it continues to be used as an anesthetic. When I used to work in the ER, that's what I used it for. It has, um, it, you know, it doesn't suppress the respiratory system, which makes it an attractive drug for that. It can be administered a variety of different ways, but almost as, um, as a side effect, it was discovered that, that um, soldiers coming back from the Vietnam War who were exposed to this drug had less instances of depression and anxiety and PTSD and mm -hmm. drug addiction and, and that sort of thing. And so um, it, it, it was studied for that for those reasons. And it turns out that ketamine, similar to other psychedelics, increases the concentration of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that helps form new pathways, new ways of thinking mm -hmm. about stuff. Um, it also increases the concentration of VEGF or VEGF, which increases blood supply to these newly formed pathways. Um, and so a lot of other psychedelics do the same thing psilocybin included. And so that's why you see some of the benefits mm -hmm. stemming from, from those psychedelics. And hopefully this legislation is going to move to a place where we're going to be able to, to prescribe it. Um, yeah. and, um, and at some point, I think we'll, we'll get there where those, um, the specific ways of doing that have been hammered out and, and we can do that for our patients. Uh, but yeah, currently um, it's, it's been legalized for personal use and a lot of my patients use it for that.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering where that's at being in regenerative medicine in Colorado. Like, I'm like, can you or are are they doing that in Colorado? But not quite yet, I guess. Yeah, not (laughs) quite yet, just because um, some of the legwork hasn't been done as far as how this law is to be implemented. Okay. Um, And so uh, hopefully it's not going to be too long. There's a lot of people that are really dedicated (laughs) to this cause working on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's going to be very much longer. But look, I have patients who are very honest with me, I I think, in a way that they're probably not as candid with their regular doctor. Maybe they're embarrassed. But most of my patients do microdose. They do Mm -hmm. use psilocybin, just grow it themselves or maybe obtain it from from friends. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is it is picking up steam. And there's other companies um, that uh, that are now coming online that will check. Uh, the purity, the content of of um, some of these things that up to now are just being made by individuals. So that way, um, once everything, all the kinks are worked out and there are companies that that are mass producing it, there's a check and balance there. For there's sure. a seal of approval there. So it's really for sure. Yeah. yeah, right now, if you're lucky enough to get your hands on it, it's like we grew these for in our yard with like we sing to them every day and <laughs> it, it, exactly. some high quality love right now. But when it get yeah, that mass production thing, there definitely need to be some checks and balance. So thanks for sharing your viewpoint on yeah. that. And I'm like, no wonder you have some awesome, awesome clients and yeah, patients. No, they're <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're, right. they're, they're really excellent. Okay, so a uh, question. So can people work with you remotely? The membership? Yeah. No, that's a that's a really good question. Um, most of our members are here local, um, uh-huh. and um, and so I see them around town, and they're they're members of our clinic. And then mm-hmm. we also have this executive health uh, program that that it, you know competes with the likes of the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, all these nice. major uh, institutions out there have these ultra deluxe programs there where individuals come in, maybe they're in town for three or four days and they undergo really extensive testing. And our, our tests are, are much better. We're not just giving you access to the to tests that most other patients have access to. Uh, these are tests that are highly reflective of one's uh, risk for the most common causes of death. And what are Americans, what are Westerners dying from? It's cancer, it's cardiovascular disease, heart attack, strokes, metabolic disease. And these tests really do a deep dive and, and you know, um, give you a, a really honest assessment of where your health is. It's one thing to think you're really fit. I have plenty of patients uh, who think they're really fit. It's another thing when you see your numbers put up side by side for age match controls. And then we also, in, as part of that executive program, work with physical therapists, nutritionists, and even when those individuals go back to wherever they're from across the US, uh, we work with with specialists local to them. So whatever is pertinent, whatever aspect of health maybe they're slightly deficient in and need help with, um, we don't just settle for any doctor. We'll do the research. We'll nice. find the right physician for them and direct them. And if they're open to flying elsewhere, um, it, then then we, we arrange for that, where wow. if there's a specialist that's really niche, um, we'll, we'll have them meet uh, with, with that patient nice. and give their input. So, um, so we do work with, with patients out of our immediate mm-hmm. geographic area. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Hopefully everybody kind of got the vibe of what you were saying there. If that, <laughs> that's pretty awesome service that you guys have provided yeah, for people. Yeah. And do they just go to rmrm.com, Rocky Mountain Regenerative Medicine, rmrm.com? Yeah, yeah that's our URL, rmrm.com. And, that's nice. <laughs> um, and go from there. So. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank, thank, thank you for the work that you're doing and for sharing with our people today. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot. 